Well, bore da pawb. Um, do we should dechre, um, gyda dweud, diolch yn fawr o bobl yma, o powake, um, maen nhw'n uh, wedi incroesawu ni i ngwlad nhw un waith eto. So, diolch yn fawr uh, iddyn nhw. Uh, hefyd, um, ti'n gallu gweld fo mae uh, dillad, dillad aloha gyda fi, a uh, sgidia tennis gyda fi, achos uh, mae'r awyren wedi colli uh, fy cludlwyth i. The uh, airline lost my luggage, so <laughs> this is what we got. So uh, bear, bear with my fashion faux pas. Um, normally when I, um, I I've, I've been asked to present here a couple times in the past, and normally I would just dive right in um, uh, to the presentation, but I thought maybe this time just a couple sentences uh, of uh, where I'm coming from. And I used to work for ILI uh, a number of years ago as the research and development department. So if any of you got to attend some of our workshops, our technology workshops, or um, those sorts of things, you probably saw me running around, uh, maybe doing some instructions for, uh, for those. And then a couple years back, um, under amicable circumstances, I left ILI to devote myself full time to working with um, people of the Mohican Nation uh, in the project of revitalizing their language, which hasn't been spoken since the 1930s. So ever, ever since I left ILI, I've been working with people from uh, the Mohican Nation uh, to you know, see what we can do about bringing that language back. So I, um, I thank ILI for letting me um, still come once a year and uh, occasionally have um, some things to share with you. The other thing is normally, um, I've, in the past, I've spoken about um, you know, immersion strategies or histories of um, the trauma that talks about why languages have um, faded the way they have. And uh, I was asked last year if I could come and speak to you today about something a bit different. And this is more mapping how languages disappear. So it's not a, a, a sort of example by example look at things that happened in different um, communities which led to the loss of language. This is more of a look at, um, almost a by the numbers look at how a language goes away and how it doesn't go away completely as well. So um, yeah, this will be a bit different from, from other things I've talked about. There'll be charts and graphs and stuff. So th this was photoshopped. It's not a real boat going over Niagara Falls. That's from my neck of the woods. And so the theme, the theme that I want to talk about today is coming back from the edge. If you look at the way um, indigenous languages across the world have uh, plummeted in numbers, it's not necessarily a gradual decline as um, some speakers pass away and they're not replaced um, by young people who are speakers. If you look at the numbers, the languages drop off a cliff. So they'll be spoken, 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 gone. It's very, very fast. So I liken it to falling over a cliff or going over the falls. It's, it seems to be something that um, is out of control and is, is falling very fast. So I'd like to talk about the nature of that fall, looking at that cliff face and seeing how, how fast this actually occurs. And then I'd like to talk about um, not where languages survive on a community, community, community by community basis, or how languages survive in the minds of individual speakers, but how languages survive in certain aspects of community life. And that's what I mean by domains. So what part of people's day-to-day -day existence do these, um, these indigenous languages uh, hang on? And so we'll, we'll look at some examples of that. And finally, how can we, 
um, as people interested in, in making languages spoken again, um, how can we reverse this, this cliff? How can we climb back up and um, get these languages spoken again in the communities? So those are the three things um, I'm going to talk about, but there will be lots of examples from around the world uh, that will help sort of illustrate um, what I'm talking about here. So back in the 60s, a, um, a linguist uh, called Greenberg came up with a set of five things that a group needs to do. This isn't necessarily indigenous language um, nation, but any group, any smaller uh, population needs to maintain its language in the long run. So stable bilingualism, and, and what, 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 I'm, what I mean by that is that the monolingual speaker is no longer a, a going concern. It's a thing of the past. People in minority language situations are going to be bilingual in the dominant outside language as well as the indigenous language to that group. But that balance has to be maintained. You can't have the outside language growing and growing and growing. That's unstable. So there's going to be bilingualism and it has to be stable. There also has to be a sense of, of identity or, or preferably a rise of, of a consciousness of um, who that group is. So if, if people start saying, well, you know, maybe I'm not, um, I'm not Cornish, I'm just part of the UK, or maybe I'm not, um, maybe I'm not uh, Udmurt, I'm just another Russian, or something like that. When that identity vanishes, so does um, part of the impetus in maintaining the language. And number three is, I think, really important and something that we've talked about at this symposium over and over again, is that language is used for the first socialization. So the first instance of a little baby meeting other people to be in the indigenous language instead of um, the outside language. If the outside language becomes that of primary socialization, um, that's not a good sign for maintenance. And then there were a couple of secondary things like um, you know, only marrying people within the group. And that, that's sort of a sense of isolation. If, if a, a language group is far enough removed from everyone else, they have a better chance of maintaining their language. There's less new people coming in who maybe aren't speakers and will upset that balance. And political non-interference, well that didn't happen. You know, no need to go into that. So really, at least in North America, um, number two is the only thing we got going for us. That stable bilingualism, primary socialization, these sorts of things are not happening in the language anymore, um, largely. And it's that sense of identity that um, the indigenous nations of this continent are different is, um, so that's one out of five. So one of the things to think about um, is, you know, what, what, what are some of these crossed out ones that maybe uh, we can focus on and um, which will improve the chances of language survival. So the, the metaphor of the cliff face comes from a concept called language tip or a tipping point. And uh, by this I mean a language which has been demographically highly stable for several centuries. So language is going along, lots of speakers being used in the community all the time, and then all of a sudden it tips over the, the edge. It just falls. Um, and after that point, the people uh, largely um, or strongly are in favor of some other language. So. Um, you know, why this happens isn't what I want to talk about today. I just want to watch the tipping in action. Um, I think a lot of people from their own communities have a strong sense of why um, there was a breakdown in speakers from the trauma experienced in the past. But instead today I just want to look at the numbers. So. How do, we, how do we see the edge coming? How do we see the edge of the cliff coming? Um, and a lot of surveys get done. 
So looking at demographics, how many speakers are there is usually the question asked. And it's, it's a tough question because, um, for instance, on the Canadian census, it has a little box and you can put any language you like in there and then you become a speaker. So one of the um, follow-up questions that doesn't get asked is, okay, well, what does a speaker mean? Does that, is that a couple of folkla, a couple words? Is it, I can have a conversation, um, but not, not too uh, complex a subject? Does it mean I'm fully fluent? Does it mean I'm literate? Does it mean all these different questions don't get asked? So instead of tracking speakers, I'd like to get rid of the idea of speakers and look at knowers and users. So what is a knower? And a knower is somebody who, let's say for, for today's discussion, somebody who has uh, the ability to speak and understand a language. That's what it takes to be a knower. But these people aren't necessarily the ones transmitting the language to others, right? So not worrying about how well you can speak the question here is how well are you transmitting the language to new people, right? That could be as a teacher, as a parent, as an elder, uh, what have you, but the knowers aren't necessarily doing that. So imagine you have 100 speakers according to your census, 25 of them live out of town. They're, they're great people, they're interested in the language, but because they live far away, they're not contributing to making new speakers. Maybe you have 25 people that know the language but don't like it, aren't interested in it, um, don't think people should be talking it anymore. Maybe 25 of those people are, um, are unhappy with the, those running the, the revival um, organization or something. So you can have all these speakers who aren't participating in um, following, uh, pushing the language ahead. The users, on the other hand, for today's discussion, are going to be the ones who are competent speakers, so they are already speakers um, to, to a good degree, but these are the people that choose to use the language um, inside their own homes and outside in the community. So the users are the ones who are passing on the language to others or making a good effort of it. And um, as, as we'll see going forward that um, you're going to have more speakers than users, but the, the number of users has a very, very strong relationship to how many speakers are there going to be in 50, 60 years. So it's the number of users are the ones that push forward a language revitalization. And it's a, it's a twisty road ahead. It's not easy to be a user. It's not easy to use the language at home. It's not easy to um, not be fully competent, but still try your best. Um, but these, it's the users are the ones that pass forward the language. So the first example I want to give is um, a language called Prezonek, which is, um, I thought it was a nice picture because they have great hats. Excellent hats. And Brazonek is spoken in the northwest of France. And it is traditionally a multilingual community. So you had the Brazonic language in the west. You had the Gallo language, which is related to French in the east. Brazonic is not related to French in any way. It's close to, uh, to Welsh. And so you have these two um, local languages, and then you have French over top. So French is the language of, of, of government and, and command and control that's on top of these other two languages. And um, here are, here's a nice uh, graph of how the language has been doing since the 1800s. So the reason why I picked uh, Brezonek as a good case study to talk about this language tipping over a cliff is because it's, there's a lot out there on it. People have been uh, following the health of the language for a good long time. And I think it, it's, it's sort of a, a universal as we'll see. Um, that what happens in this language has happened to other languages all around the world. So up until about 1935, uh, we have stable bilingualism, around the million speakers mark. And it would sort of fluctuate up and down as the population of the region uh, goes up and down. But you had a good number of people 
we're just speaking and passing it along to the next generation. Up until about 1935. And then if you follow the yellow line, the, the, the users split off from the knowers. So the users drops and it just falls down. So people who are able to speak the language no longer do. You see that the orange line, the knowers, still stays constant for a while. But as the users stop using the language in the community, um, 30 years later, look what happens to the knowers. Right, there's that Niagara Falls right there. So, uh, so we'll see that again. The, the, as the users drop off, the speakers, the knowers, um, vanish in 30 years. That's really fast. That's within, um, easily within one lifetime, within one household. So what happened here? Well, again, I don't want to talk about the, the French school system. I don't want to talk about the French um, laws that say France is indivisible and everyone speaks French in it and so it shall ever be. Or the signs that used to be on front of schools, don't spit or speak Breton here. Um, what I'd just like to talk about is what happened within the community itself. So internal to the, the, the Breton people. Um, so in the 1870s, that's uh, during stable bilingualism, in the 1870s, people started leaving the region for various reasons. So what, people would go fight in the military, and then they would come back having lived in a French world. Or people started going to government schools where, um, where Breton was abused out of the children. And people went away to work in, in more industrialized parts of the country. So that by the time you're in the 1900s, you have people lar largely being French speakers and speakers of Brezelnik. And then in the 50s, you have a lot of these people who had moved away from the community coming back, um, coming back home, but not being speakers of the language anymore. And so what you end up with in the sort of 40s and 50s, if you look on the chart on the right, a typical family household. So this is all under one roof. You have grandparents who are speakers of Brezonek. That's the language they grew up with. It's the language they speak well, but they got a bit of French. They can understand it if they need to. Their children are also speakers of Brezonek, but they're also fluent speakers of French. So they learned Brezonek from their parents at home and then learned French everywhere else. Those parents' older children so this is before 1950. Their older children were also bilingual, stable bilinguals, but their younger children lost Brezonek almost altogether, and they were only French speakers. So within one household, you have a lot of dynamics going on, and it's really fast. Older brothers versus younger sisters are going to be speaking different languages. So looking at that, um, that falling over the cliff on the, the timeline chart, if we zoom in to one year, so zooming into 2007 when another survey was done to see who was speaking. This isn't the users list, this is the knowers graph. And you know, the people in their 70s are 50, you know, just under 50% of the people can speak the language, which you know ain't too bad. And then it starts to fall. So the, um, if you sort of skip over one column, you get to their children. So the 40 to 59 column is the children of the 75 column. And look at the difference. And then the 20 to 39 column is the children of the 60 to 74 column. And there's another huge drop. Now you'll see that in the 15 to 19 column, we have a bit of a rise. So what is that? That is decades and decades and decades of immersion school that has been going on in, in the, uh, the country for, since the 70s. So how many years is that from 2007? 40 years of immersion school has pushed up that far. So that's in one sense pretty good because it's not dropping anymore. There's still speakers in that age group. 
But I think people were largely very disappointed that of all the efforts of how immersion schools were going to make a huge and significant difference, only pushed it up a tiny bit. And if you look at the age group below 15, it's virtually nothing, no speakers. So below 15 are the people who haven't gone to the immersion schools. So they're not picking it up at home, they're picking up the language in the schools alone. So the 10% level of the 40 to 59 year olds, so 10% of the people left in the, um, in the area were speakers, that's when it shifted from learning at home to learning at school. And so there has been that slight increase which has sort of stopped the, the bleeding, so to speak. Um, so in that sense, in, in Brittany um, and other places that have had long ongoing immersion schools, the immersion schools have stopped the, the fall, but haven't um, improved the number of users or speakers um, significantly at this point. So that's one case study. Uh, moving into the North Shore of Cape Breton Island um, in Canada, the reason for the decline there was a little bit different um, than what it was in, in Brittany. And there was this uh, belief by the Canadian education uh, system, and this is a quote from an early, or early 1900 superintendent of education, is that how great an obstacle Gallic is to progress in the acquisition of a thorough English education. So how incredible speaking this language is to, getting, uh, to stopping you getting an education. So that was sort of the, the, the thinking in Canada at the time, both for native uh, indigenous Canadian languages and languages of um, colonizers that were also minoritized. And this thinking leaked into the general population of Gallic speakers. So here's a few quotes uh, from people who were parents or who had grown up during that time um, commenting on the attitudes of parents. And one speaker says, parents thought that teaching Gaelic would, would confuse the two languages in their children's minds. So we just stopped. It's English only, because we didn't want to, to um, penalize children for, uh, for their education. Because when you start out speaking Gaelic, learning English is really, really hard. And this is, you can think of it as the one language belief, that humans are somehow only capable of holding one language in their mind at a time. And this exists definitely to this day. My kids are in French immersion in their local school, and there's a big meeting every year where all the parents who are interested in sending their kids to French immersion go to worry about their kids um, falling behind because they're, t they're learning another language at the time. It's every year it's the same thing. The parents come and they say, can I pull my kid out of immersion when I notice they're failing? And the people who run the immersion say, no, no, they're not going to fail. It'll be fine. Kids can manage. Humans can manage multiple languages in our minds. But there's this belief these days that we can only have one language at a time. Because, you know, when you start out in your language, learning English is really, really hard. So what did this attitude lead to in the North Shore of Cape Breton Island? Um, this, is a, this graph shows a survey from 1990 going through how old somebody is and what their ability was in the Gallic language. So you can see the, from the blue line are the stable bilinguals. Those are the people who have a good command of both languages. And the 80-year-olds are up around 90%. I mean, that was just the way the community functioned. People were, uh, did some things in one language, some things in another, and that's, that's fine. And then, you know, people in their 70s and 60s, still 70%, I mean, that's, that's really quite good. And these are the people who grew up as speakers. So they grew up with the language at home. And then look at the 40 and 60 year olds. The blue line falls dramatically. And as the blue line falls, look at what the orange line is doing. 
Those are the people who, um, according to the study, were called imperfect bilinguals, but these are the people who grew up hearing it but never spoke it. They're the people who have a good understanding of, of what people are saying, but are either incapable of or often are, feel they're unable to respond um, in the language. So they didn't really fully acquire it. And as those numbers go up, um, they become parents, and they're no longer able to pass on the language to their children, and that's the yellow line. So the yellow line skyrockets up, the English-only people, because they just never heard it. They never had an opportunity to hear the language um, in their home or in their community at all. And so how are they supposed to learn it, right? And that number just goes up. But look, this is all within 20, 30 years. It's really, really fast. And we saw that with Blazonek as well, that these languages disappear, or they don't disappear fully, but they drop super fast. I want to do two more examples. Uh, Manambu is a language from um, northern New Guinea. There are about 2,100 speakers. So this is a quite different historical and political and cultural situation than the other two examples, which were also quite distinct from each other. And it's spoken in the East Sepik region of uh, Papua New Guinea. And here's another look at a family household um, or a, an extended family in the community. And if you look at the grandparents, look at how many languages they have. They have Manambu, which is their local language. They have Iatmu, and they have Kuma, which they can speak quite well. And these are the languages of, let's say, their wives or husbands. If they marry outside, people would just learn both. Um, or they might be ceremonial languages, that when you have to go to a certain ceremony in a neighboring village, you would use their language uh, during that. That's what the Iatmu language is doing there. And then a little bit of Tokpizin, which is sort of the the rural uh, common language um, amongst all the, different, um, all the different villages. Now, if the parents stayed in the village, they didn't move to the city, Manambu stayed good, Tok Pizin became um, moderately good, and they picked up a little bit of English. But look at the diversity disappearing at this point. We've gone from one, two, three, four languages to three. And the parents who moved to the city are also speakers of Manambu because they grew up in the village. Their talk Pizin gets quite good and their English gets quite good. But it's their kids where everything changes. So even in the village, Manambu's disappearing. And that talk Pizin is becoming the standard language there. And the kids who move to the city, the language is almost gone. And that English and talk Pizin are the main things that these kids know. In fact, English is pretty much the thing that they know best. And I think that's mirrored in North America and around the world for people who leave the community and move to the city. It is extremely difficult to maintain the language there because that, that sense of um, isolation that you get in the village to say, well, this is an area where we can speak our language um, is gone. And I want to give one more example. This one's from Brazil, the Tariana language. There are about 100 speakers in the mid-90s, and this is the area um, along the uh, Wapes River where it's spoken. And again, the great-grandparents great have a huge diversity in languages, and this has a lot to do with um, marrying people from outside, and people just managed, you know, they can have four or five languages in their head. And then the grandparents kept that up to some degree, but Spanish and Portuguese are creeping in. And then the parents switch over from one language to another. They switch to Tucano, which is another indigenous language in the area. And then the kids have lost Tariana altogether and just speak Portuguese, pretty much. So again, th this falling off the cliff happens very, very fast in, in two generations. So what are some observations of, of those of us who are clinging to the cliff face, um, maintaining or hoping to maintain the languages? Well, one observation is that you have this series of, of three generations. You have the grandparents who are fluent and multilingual. You have the parents who um, may have some bilingualism, 
um, but may only have some of the language uh, in their minds. And then you have the kids who are monolingual and don't have any of the indigenous language at all. So this trend happens all over the world. And um, it's always, it seems in these cases, the indigenous language, which is the one that gets pressured out. So it has pressure from the outside world coming in and forcing itself through um, all aspects of life. And you have pressure from the inside too, which I haven't talked about yet, which is this uh, feeling of perfectionism. Like if I don't speak my language perfectly, I'm in the red column in the middle, I'm a parent, I only have some of the language. If I don't speak it perfectly, then I'm too ashamed or I'm too embarrassed or I'm too shy to use it, whatever my level is. And that's the sort of psychological pressure, one of the pressures that comes from the inside. So back to the graphs. So I've mapped out these two graphs. We can see the fall, the change in, in language use. And these are called S-curves. So anyone who's done statistics or looked it up, um, S-curves are the standard universal way of plotting change. So here we've got electric car ownership, follows an S-curve. You know, it goes flat for a while, huge change, and then goes flat again. Um, active users of Facebook follows that same S-curve. So whenever you see a dramatic change in the way a community or society behaves, it almost always follows this shape, this S-curve shape. And so we can see here I've sort of overlaid the S's um, over the, the two graphs, the two charts that we saw before. And yeah, they follow the same pattern. The same S-curve is happening. So it's monitoring a change that people do, right? No matter how unusual the circumstances were that caused the change, the change itself is behaving the way humans tend to in many aspects of life. And if you look at the, the one on the top, this is the really cool thing from a math perspective and the really frightening thing from a revitalization perspective is how accurately the knowledge of the language curve follows the user's curve by about 30 years. So one generation, parents and children. So the user curves drops, and then 30 years later, the, num the people able to speak drops almost identically. Um, in, the, in the North Shore of Cape Breton Gaelic speakers, look how the S curve interacts with that orange curve, the, the semi-speakers, the rememberers of the language. Um, the, the remembers that orange curve almost hits halfway right up the S curve. So we'll, we'll stew on those numbers for a while, uh, or those graphs, those ideas, and maybe come back to them a bit later. Next I'd like to talk about domains. So domains are those aspects of daily life where the language may or may not be used. And a, uh, this could be a public domain, so something that happens outside your home. It could be a private domain inside your house, speaking with your relatives. Um, and in a stable bilingual situation, we expect some diversity, right? So it's not that if I go back to Wales, everything will be in Welsh again, because that's the goal. No, not everything is going to be in Welsh. Some of the things are, and some of the things aren't. Um, but the looking at domains will tell you um, some interesting things comparing what thi where the language is strong and where it isn't. And you can make a table. So this is sort of homework if you so uh, choose to take on the task, is where you can map out where in your community um, domains are in the language or where in the community they're not. And we're back in Brittany again in the 1980s in the um, town of Carrez. And uh, a, a, a survey was done to find out where the language is being used. So the, the first row, which says BZH, that is the Brezonic row, that is the native language row. The second one, FR, is the French row. Um, and the colors are indicated on the right-hand side. So where it's green, that means you hear the language 20% of the time or better. Where it's yellow, it's between 5 to 10% of the time, so really not very often. And red is virtually you don't hear it at all. 
less than 5% of the time the language is used in that domain. And so let's look at the first row, the Brazonic row, and see where is it strong? Where is the language doing well? What cells in my table are colored in green? So in the 1980s, it was strong at home. This is good news, right? That means that people are still using the language in the homes in the 1980s. But notice that right below it, French is also very strong in the home. So there's a, a degree of bilingualism has now entered the home. It is also strong in cafes. Well, that's interesting. I mean, it is France. They have cafes. But in Brittany, a cafe is a very specific thing where older men go to hang out after work. So it's a very specific kind of people go to the cafes. It's not mixed. Not everybody goes who wants a coffee. It's like, um, it's like an old guy's club or something where they go, and the language is ubiquitous there. Notice it's the only place where French has a red mark underneath it. So French is absolutely not cool in the cafes. Agriculture. So that's the traditional economic activity of this region. Um, and in agriculture, the language is still strong. French is coming in a bit, but it's... Um, and the last one is the, uh, in the seniors' clubs. Is, but notice here, too, that French is also strong. So that's a bilingual situation in the seniors' clubs. So I look at this, and I think, what do the strong domains have in common? And what they have in common are the people that you meet there are your friends or family. These are sort of your safest people. Um, the cafes, that's where all the guys hang out, right? The old buddies, they all go to the cafe, and I know everybody there. We show up every day after work. The farm is, well, my family on the farm and my neighbors. And we all, we've known each other for generations. Um, so all the places in Brittany, in this region, where the language is strong are areas where you know the people who are going to be there. Uh, right. So the domains in flux, the, the weak domains, these are the, the yellow ones. And these are hanging on in some traditional activities. So the market is like an open-air market in the middle of town, right? They run it on the weekends, maybe every Saturday. People show up and they haggle for prices and all that kind of thing. It's a long-term uh, cultural activity that has been going on for, for centuries. So there's still language in the market. The, the people who go there like to haggle in, in, in the language. And in the local neighborhood, um, you can still hear the language. Or in religion, cultural protection. This one was really neat. These are the people who run the committees to save the language. And this is a weak domain. So that means the meetings that discuss how do we save the Brazonic language are being conducted in French. Does that ring a bell? Perhaps? It's shocking. You'd think this is the one place where the, the language would be strong because these are the people who care about it the most, yet they have their debates in the language, and may, or in French, and maybe the language is just used for a speech every now and then. But these places where the language is weak but still being used are, it's not as close to you as your family and best friends, but there's still faces you recognize, there's still people you know. I know the people in my neighborhood. I know the people in my place of worship. I know the people um, on my cultural protection committee. So it's still a somewhat safe place to use the language. Now, where it's weak are in, so not weak, where it's absent, where there's no Brazonic virtually at all, are in the modern or non-local activities. So modern meaning that they're not things that we've been doing here for centuries. There are things that have been brought in, or things that involve people not from my uh, social group. So the street, this is just going to be people I meet in the street. I don't know who you are. I don't know if you're a speaker or not. I use French. Um, in the shops, so this isn't the market where we speak Blazonic. This is the, the drugstore or the supermarket in town. It's weird because it's the same people. Right? The market and the shops have the same people, but I use different languages in, in each um, domain, in each situation, because there are other people there that I don't know. Um, the bars are where 
the old guys don't go. The bars are sort of a cultural import from the rest of France, and that's where everybody else goes. And there's no Blazonic there at all. Cultural festivals is another really weird thing that you would expect to see lots of language use in. These are like music festivals or drama festivals or whatever, but they're almost done invariably in French. Again, talking about the language, but not talking in the language. You know, not being users of the language. And look at school and media. They're both places where nobody uses Blazonic at all. So even in immersion schools, you know, it's hard to jump over that boundary of taking the language outside the classroom. You know, are the kids using it on the playground? Are they using it, um, you know, when, uh, when non-classroom activities are going on, talking to their peers? And in this uh, survey, anyway, the kids were not doing that. They were speaking French to each other, and all the media was in French, radio, TV, um, what have you. So we got... Mr. Strong, what are our strong domain goals? So let's look at the, the domains where the, the language was still being used. And in a revitalization movement, this is a great place to focus maintenance. These are the places that must be protected at all costs, right? So if you're running one of those cafes, don't hire a French-only speaking um, uh, cafe. What, what are they called, cafistas, whatever? You know, the people who pour coffee. Um, don't hire any of them because they're gonna break this continuity of language. Um, you know, as far as the home goes, the language is still being processed at home, but let's guard against the one language theory. Speaking your native language is not going to hinder your picking up of French or English. It just doesn't. I mean, there's, Google it, there's a zillion surveys uh, from immersion programs that show that this is not the case. In fact, if you're bilingual, you're less likely to suffer symptoms of Alzheimer's. So, uh, you know, it changes the way the brain works to the better. And then you look at these strong domains and say, well, how do we branch out from these things where the language works to involve more people? So we have the cafes where for the, um, the old guys to hang out. Maybe we can have a cafe for younger people or maybe have a cafe for women to hang out, or, or what have you, somewhere where the um, immersion kids can go after school to shoot pool and talk in the language or, or whatever. Uh, but take the concept of the cafe which works in this community, or whatever is working in your community, and how can you spread that to be more inclusive? And the other thing, the other strong language domain were um, things like, in this case, agricultural. So how do we make sure that French doesn't take over um, the traditional economic activities? Be that trapping, be that farming, hunting, what have you. When you take the kids out on the land, a lot of elders say, have said to me that that's where I learned and that's where my kids are going to learn because it's one of those traditional domains where the language is strong. So these have to be maintained. This isn't a place to revitalize the language. This is a place to maintain it. But in the weak domains, and here's Little Miss Trouble. You guys don't read Mr. Men books to your kids? <laughs> it must be a Commonwealth thing. I don't know. Um, oh, we lost. I stepped on something. There we go. It's coming back. Great. So... These are potential places for growth. So this is, these are domains where the language has been doing okay-ish. So maybe those are great places to change things around. These are places where we can um, focus on community activities where everybody is relatively comfortable with each other. So you're not bringing in a whole bunch of people who don't know each other and say, all right, Sharadu Gamraig, go! and everyone stares at their shoes and doesn't know what to do and someone cracks a joke and the whole thing collapses. The reason why these weak domain places have uh, apparently been doing well is because people are familiar with each other and they feel that this is a safe environment. And um, these are great places to bring in those rememberers, right? Those um, orange lines, the people who, who remembered the language but aren't necessarily comfortable speaking it. It's really tough to take a learner and throw them into the cafe with all the old guys. 
and say, all right, go speak. Or it's really hard to take a, somebody who grew up in the language up until a young age and then lost it for whatever reason, throw them into the seniors club and say, okay, go learn the language. These are very stressful situations. Whereas these weaker domains might be better places to introduce these uh, people who were fantastic resources. And then while this is going on, because you have your chart of domains and you, you have your graphs, you know, be alert to anything changing. Like, are the users increasing? That could be really good news, because just as the language drops fast, it also has the potential of rising fast, right? So um, watch out for any changes in the way people are using the language in these domains. You know, it's a good canary in a cage to see what's going on. And then in the no language domains, this is Mr. Nobody, poor Mr. Nobody, um, maybe just throw these on the back burner for now, right? Maybe these are the places where, um, in the North American context, English is just always going to be dominant, right? Like maybe television media is just going to be an English thing. And the amount of energy and effort and um, hours of work that go into making one hour's worth of television in your native language, you know, is that... Is that increasing users? Is that increasing um, speakers of the language in the same way as we could have done in one of these weaker domains instead of the nobody domains? And oddly enough, it's these back burner difficult ideas that are often the easiest to implement. Right? So we saw in, in um, the town in Brittany that the street is not a good place for the language uh, survival. But one of the things people do is put up street signs. And I love looking at street signs in other languages. You really get a sense of being somewhere else. But this is not um, necessarily going to make the huge difference because it's a no, it's a no language domain anyway, being on the streets. Or online media or that kind of thing. It's something that, that's easy to do. Um, it's easy to record a, a podcast for an hour in the language or something, but it's not making the same impact improving language in the home is going to do. So these are great kind of one-off projects, but revitalization is a long-term um, long process. And then new domains are going to come in. And if you remember from the, the domain chart before, all of the new ideas, new cultural practices coming in in Brittany were invariably in French. So one should not be surprised that all of these new things are entering uh, communities in North America in English, right? This, this is to be expected and prepared for. Um, you know, we, we would think that these things are just, that people are gonna go online, play video games, whatever, in English. Um, but maybe before they can get a foothold, you can just push them a little bit, edge them towards something more language friendly. Maybe these things haven't been solidified to the extent that, let's say, TV media has. And maybe there's some room for, for, uh, for wiggling here. But again, that's, it's probably a low outcome maneuver. Um, whereas working at the home or working on other places where the language has been strong has, um, at least according to this, this sort of concept, a better chance of making a difference. So for new speakers, uh, um, I touched on it before, a strong domain can be intimidating, a fear of making mistakes. Um, these are exactly the places where you want to bring up children in these strong language areas, but maybe the learners can go um, take it easy a bit and, and go in the weak language domains where the language is still being spoken actively. So it's not where I can, I can fudge out and speak English when I don't know the words, um, it's just the sort of cultural baggage I'm carrying into that situation won't be as strong. And the no language domains are places um, like cultural institution, protection institutions, where non-speakers can railroad or contribute to the revitalization process depending on what happens. So I say railroad because um, you know a lot of orthography committees have been formed over the years where people have argued for, for decades about spelling. And this was a big thing in Brittany, 
where there are three or four different ways of spelling and people continue to argue about it to this day. And these are the sort of things that non-speakers argue about. As far as I know, speakers want to move forwards and, and teach the language and hear the language and speak it all the time. They're not the ones who are, excuse my French, bitching and complaining about the way the orthography is written. On the other hand, um, you know, non-speakers do have something to contribute. And, um, but maybe being on these sort of black holes like orthography committees are not the place for that. That's just my rant. I won't go any further on my rant. So, can this S-curve be reversed? Um, you know, if an S-curve can track change or innovation going down, can it track change going up? Is the re revitalization movement going to make an S-curve towards users? So, I mean, human nature says yes. You know, when things change, it follows this pattern. So there's not going to be an immediate turnaround right now, right? So whatever projects are ongoing right now, it's going to be a slow climb, slow climb, pow. That's what we're aiming for. Um, so that even one of the more um, sort of, what, what's, the, what's the term? The poster children of language revitalization, like if the, the Welsh language, um, since it, it's got its S-curve, stable bilingualism at about 80%, drops off. In this case, it shows it drops off a little more slowly because it's taking the whole country as a whole. If we looked at individual places, we would see it drop much faster. Um, and then in the 70s, when the political movements happened to change language policy, and if you go from 75 to maybe 2010, it's stabilized. It hasn't been climbing. I mean, there was a celebration two censuses ago where the number of Welsh speakers increased, and that was excellent, and everyone was really happy to see the language skyrocket at that point. And then the next census comes out and shows it dropped by another few thousand. So we're at that part of the S-curve where it's just going to wave a little bit. Um, and future projections of where the language is going to go, even the best projections, don't show the language skyrocketing up yet. And just like in Brittany, when you break it down by age group, the three to six-year-olds are not speakers. Right? So they're, they, according to this survey, it's when they go into kindergarten, when they're sent to the immersion school, is where they're picking up the language, which means the domain of the home has broken down in a lot of places. And as we saw before, um, and as others have talked about, this is a key spot where language must be maintained. So if, if that blue line is going to go up, um, that's going to require uh, better use in the home. So something to think about, going back to the graphs again, is where is your community in terms of users? sort of percentage-wise. Not speakers, um, which is, you know, really hard to discuss because, you know, is a speaker somebody who can say hello? Is a speaker someone who can introduce themselves? Is a speaker who can speak for 20 hours on the history of a, uh, a certain concept? They're all speakers. So let's leave speakers aside as not very useful for the revitalization um, discussion. They're very useful for documentation purposes or what have you, but really we need users. So if, if that's our, our users up in stable bilingualism on our, on our graph, we're awesome. No, no immediate problem right now, but let's be careful. If it's starting to get to that, you know, boat going over Niagara Falls, look out, because here it's going to start. Here's where the tumble over the cliff happens. And if you show that the users has dropped significantly, oh, but we still got lots of speakers, we're fine, everything will be fine. Um, no, what, wait 30 years. Because as we've seen, the lag of speakers to users is one generation. So be on the lookout for that. Oh, back to the graphs one more time. Um, where is your community in terms of almost speakers? You know, have they reached parity with fluent speakers? If that is the case, expect language drop in the next generation, because we've seen that happen elsewhere. 
And where is your community strong? Make your own chart. You're going to have different, different columns at the top, different kinds of things that go on. Um, and, you know, be honest. Where is the language being used? Where is it not being used? And where are there openings for growth? So we can't do everything at once. It's just not the resources, not the people. But where, where are the good targets for right now so that we can start to climb up the cliff? You know, remember, multilingualism is the human rule. It's something we can all do. And the language-friendly domains are a great place to start and then be ready for any changes because, my gosh, change happens fast. Really, really fast. Thank you so much.